If it's Friday, it all starts in Iowa. We're live in dangerously cold Des Moines, where all eyes are on the front runner, the field, and the weather as caucus goers and candidates face frigid temperatures in the final 72 hours before the first in the nation presidential contest. Plus, the U.S. military leads deadly airstrikes against dozens of Iran backed Houthi targets in Yemen, prompting vows of vengeance from the rebels and stoking fears of further escalations in the Middle East. And Congress barrels toward a partial government shutdown as House Republicans revolt against Speaker Johnson's spending agreement with just one week to go until the deadline. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I am Kristen Welker. We are here in a very snowy, very cold Des Moines, Iowa, with just three days to go until the all-important Republican caucuses get underway. And let me tell you, folks, it sure is cold out here. That is the word of the day. The weather is now a factor for candidates and caucus goers. You are looking at some of the wintry scenes all across the state this week. The cold and the snow forced campaigns to cancel events today. Now, the forecast for Monday is dangerously cold temperatures with stinging wind chills, colder than any previous caucus day. And candidates are doing their best to motivate their supporters to brave the cold and turn out to caucus. I know it's going to be cold. Uh, I know it's going to be um, um, not the most pleasant, but I don't think you'll ever be able to cast a vote that has more impact given the circumstances. We don't know what the turnout's going to be. It could be much smaller than what it's been in, you know, in the 16th cycle. That's possible. It's going to be cold. They've already told you that. Well, you know what? George Washington didn't complain about the weather when he crossed the Delaware. It's going to be negative 15, but I'm going to be out there, and I want you to go out there. But you get it. Iowans get it. You know that you start all of this. You know you send a message to the rest of the country about where you think we should go. Now, in addition to watching the weather, we are also watching to see just how dominant former President Trump's performance is on caucus night. Polls shown leading by more than 30 points, which would be an historic margin of victory. The current record in an Iowa Republican caucus is... I'm hearing her on delay, so I'm just going to turn it off. Tell them. Okay. And of course, we're also watching the fight for second place. Nikki Haley is hoping she'll have a strong showing here and it'll give her some momentum heading into the New Hampshire primary. Ron DeSantis, who staked his entire campaign on a strong performance in Iowa, may need a second place finish to even have a campaign this time next week. Joining me now here is NBC News' Garrett Haig. Garrett, you have been covering this campaign from the beginning. Well, we'll go sledding after this. Well, I hope so, yeah. First of all, let's start here because it is snowing. Um, you were here in 2012, mm -hmm. as was I, covering caucuses then back in 2016. This cycle feels unique. It feels different. What are you watching and what are the key themes for you right now? Well, I think the fact that Donald Trump is running as functionally an incumbent and we're seeing as being treated as an incumbent is really making this different from those other caucuses. The fact that he has had such a dominant lead really from the jump without anybody coming close to challenging him in a significant way, coupled with this weather, which has made the idea that anyone could sprint anywhere, much less kind of sprint through the finish line, has taken some of the urgency out of what we've seen here at the end of the day. But when you talk to Trump uh, and his, when you talk to Trump's staff and you talk to his supporters, they really want to try to break the record here. They want to prove that he is this dominant figure in the party and see if they can end this primary process before it even really gets started. And Garrett, it, it's notable because you've been talking to first time caucus mm -hmm. goers as well. And they are fueling part of the enthusiasm That's that right. we're feeling around these caucuses that are set to get underway in just three days from now. What are they telling you? So this is interesting because this is a group that, you know, it's very difficult to measure, right? And Donald Trump has always done well with people who he has pulled in from outside of politics, non-traditional Republicans, non-traditional political people at all, whether they be young people, whether they be folks who just didn't care about voting before. Our poll has shown that he gets 63 percent of people who identify themselves as first time caucus goers. And what he's done differently now than what he was able to do even in 2016 when he came close here but couldn't win is he's professionalized his operation and they are turning these people who are first-time caucus goers into volunteers and caucus
caucus captains, and they're sort of weaponizing them in this caucus in a way that he's not been able to do before but could be really decisive on Monday. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Obviously, this is all about the people who are going to turn out. Mm -hmm. And we are watching Donald Trump, but we're watching this all-important fight for second place, in That's part right. because the game has changed mm -hmm. after Chris Christie has now gotten out of the race. He was barely a blip here in Iowa, but he was polling at 12 percent in New Hampshire. So if Nikki Haley can have a strong showing here, Garrett, she heads into New Hampshire with a lot of momentum. I've been talking to some undecided voters. They say they are now looking at Nikki Haley. What is your sense of this second place fight? Well, look, I've been at DeSantis and Haley events this week, and I have met people who are considering both candidates at the other's events, right? There are still people who are certainly shopping between the two here in Iowa. In New Hampshire, it's a more interesting picture, as you say, because Haley appears to be in a much stronger second place there. And the polling indicates that she could take some of those, perhaps the majority of those Christie supporters with her, with him being out of the race. She has the narrowest possible opportunity here to make this a real fight. But you could see it. If You could see it if you look hard enough. A strong second place here, you know, pulling those Christie voters, maybe even winning in New Hampshire. But again, it's going to take that generating that momentum, generating that enthusiasm. I, her events were larger than they have been for her recently, but I don't know if I've detected that kind of like groundswell that would make this into a real fight. Uh, we'll find out on Monday. You sure will. You're going to be there to cover all of it, Garrett. Your reporting has been tremendous. Thank <laughs> you for being here. In this Stay show warm. I will try. Thank you, Garrett. Really appreciate that great analysis. Now we want to head over to Sioux City, Iowa. That is where my colleague, NBC's Priscilla Thompson, is live. She's talking to coffee sewers there. And Priscilla, Sioux City is a county that could give us some early insight into the enthusiasm for former President Donald Trump. What are caucus goers there telling you, Priscilla? Yeah, absolutely, Kristen. And we are hearing from a lot of caucus goers in Sioux County who say that they're still undecided. Some of them may not make a choice until caucus night, but that they are leaning towards Donald Trump, even as they are kind of between Ron DeSantis and Trump. We spoke with first time caucus goers at Northwestern College. That is a Christian college here. We also spoke with folks at the local pizza ranch, Republicans there. And I want to play some of those conversations for you. The one that stands out to me the most is probably Donald Trump. It's because he, like, he is, I feel like he has more of authority and people, like, different countries, like, respect him more than, like, it, so far, like, any other presidents I could think of. I think Ron is a good leader, too, but, like, I don't really know much about him yet because he's been the governor of Florida and... We've seen four years with Donald Trump already. I am still undecided, but I do believe I'm leaning towards Trump. Tell me why. Um, I, I believe that he did what he said he was going to do in 2016. And I was surprised about that. And the idea of Trump being a known entity is something that we heard over and over from reporter uh, from caucus goers that we've talked to across the state. Obviously, we're here where there's a very large evangelical population, abortion ranking really high on a lot of these caucus goers list of priorities. And they say that while Donald Trump did sort of pave the way for the overturning of Roe v. Wade, that's not necessarily the deciding factor for them this time around. Kristen? Really fascinating to hear from those caucus goers, Priscilla. And of course, just taking a step back for a bit, Donald Trump didn't do so well in Sioux City back in 2016. So hearing that enthusiasm for him is certainly significant as we head into the big caucus night. Priscilla Thompson, thank you so much from Sioux City, Iowa. Now I want to head over to Steve Kornacki, who is live at the big board. And Steve, of course, you are watching all 99 counties here in Iowa, but there are a few that are particularly significant. Tell us what you're watching and tell us what we should be watching for on caucus night. Yeah, I, a couple things here. We'll just pick up where you left off with Priscilla here. Show you Sioux County here, you know, northwest Iowa, really. Uh, this is an area, you know, evangelicals play a big role in Iowa caucuses in general. 
back in 2016, 64% of the Iowa Republican uh, electorate was evangelical Christian, but it's especially true in Northwest Iowa, and it's not just folks who are uh, affiliated uh, as evangelical Christians, it's folks who go to church regularly. Church is a major part of their lives, and I think it's no, it, it's no true anywhere else but Sioux County. And we saw in 2016 how skeptical evangelicals were of Donald Trump. Many were at the beginning, and the story of the last eight years has been this political bond Trump seems to have uh, uh, generated with them. So again, Sioux County back in 2016, Here's the result. Ted Cruz won it. You don't even see Donald Trump's name here at the top. He finished at 11 percent, his worst of the 99 counties. So I think Sioux County is one we're going to look at right away or as soon as we get results in it. We can't control the order of these counties come in. But as soon as we get Sioux County, I think it's going to tell a big story. This is a story about Donald Trump. Has he improved his standing with evangelicals? How much has he improved his standing with evangelicals? Is he winning this county? Is he winning it big? It's also a story about Ron DeSantis. If Ron DeSantis is going to make a stand on Monday night, he has really courted evangelicals aggressively, gotten endorsement from one of the top evangelical leaders of the state. This was, as we see, a Cruz County in 2016. This is the kind of place that DeSantis has really got to make a stand, make a statement if he's going to be a factor and he's going to pull off a surprise of any sort uh, on Monday night. Now, let's look at it from Nikki Haley's standpoint. If we zoom out to all the counties here, Nikki Haley, we found her, her strongest support, political independence, college educated voters, higher income voters, voters in the suburbs, voters with a more negative view of Donald Trump. Um, broadly speaking, the coalition that Haley's been putting together in Iowa and elsewhere resembles the coalition that Marco Rubio had in Iowa back in 2016. So I'm going to call the 2016 results up on the screen here. And again, the pink counties here, Salmon, whatever you want to call them, these are the Rubio counties. Now, there's only five of them that he won. But see, he came close to getting set. He really came close in Iowa overall. These are, big, these are, relatively speaking, Iowa, densely populated big counties. They're the counties, too, with the highest concentration. This is Polk County, the state capital. This is Dallas County, suburbs, wealthy suburbs right outside of, uh, of Des Moines, one of the highest concentrations of college degrees in the state. This is Story County, where Iowa State University is, one of Donald Trump's worst counties, one of Marco Rubio's counties. Uh, this is Johnson County, most Democratic county in the state, Iowa City, John, um, uh, University of Iowa, Scott County, where Davenport is. These are the five counties that Rubio won. Is Haley winning these five counties? Is she winning any of them? Is she winning all five of them? If she's going to get a, a second place showing and get the momentum Garrett was talking about to go into New Hampshire, she's got to be doing real well in these five counties. And the other question with her, too, is where did Rubio fall short and where could, could Haley make inroads in the places where Rubio fell flat in 16? Could she move beyond that base of the well-educated higher income? Because take a look like at southern Iowa here near the Missouri border. We, you get, county after county looks like this. Rubio didn't even register here. These are small rural counties here. Mm. Rubio didn't even register. Ben Carson got third. You know, Ben Carson got third. So you see it over and over in these counties. Ben Carson, not Marco Rubio. So Haley, if she's going to have a surprise showing here, a really strong showing in Iowa, it's not just winning or doing well in those Rubio counties, showing inroads in the rural places with low concentrations of college degrees where Rubio didn't register at all. And where her types of the voters who are gravitating towards her are not many in number so far in those places. Well, we know you will be watching it closely. We're going to be talking to you throughout the weekend, including on Meet the Press on Sunday. Steve Kornacki, thank you for breaking all of that down for us. Really appreciate it. Now we are joined by senior political editor Mark Murray, who is here braving the elements with me in Des Moines. Mark, thank you for being here. It's awesome. It, it's awesome. It's awesome. Look, let's pick up where Steve left off. You talk about a place like Sioux County, the importance of that, the fact that Donald Trump didn't do well there in 2016. And boy, you heard that enthusiasm in Priscilla Thompson's piece there. Do you think this could be a potential historic night for former President Trump? Yeah, and it's important to note that he is the former president of his yes. party. And still importantly, he is still incredibly popular. And so he's being treated in a different way than he ever was in 2016. I think it's important for us to kind of remember that. But our poll and other polls end up showing him with a substantial lead, potentially historic lead, Kristen, in this contest. And so I do think that that's something for us to kind of keep in mind as we battle, see who battles out 
out for second place, where, you know, Donald Trump and his standing might be the biggest storyline of them all on Monday night. And I know we're talking about this battle for second place as well. Steve Kornacki talking about the fact that Nikki Haley, if she wants to do well, she's got to do well in the suburbs. Educated voters, she's got to be able to pick up that swath of voters if she wants to, for example, come in second place. What does the second place finish mean for a Nikki Haley versus a Ron DeSantis? Yeah, so for Nikki Haley, it means that that momentum is real. Even yeah. in a place, remember, she hasn't campaigned in Iowa as much as Ron DeSantis has. Ron DeSantis is the one who has the endorsement from the state sitting governor, Kim Reynolds. He's the one who's been to all 99 counties. And if somehow he finishes it in third place, that is a huge indictment on him. Nikki Haley might be able to afford a third place finish because we've seen her situation in New Hampshire. She's actually in a pretty decent position right now, regardless of what happens here on Monday night. So I do think that Ron DeSantis has more on the line than Nikki Haley does. But then again, everybody, we're going to see the intensity. If you can actually come out to vote uh, and participate on the Monday caucus in these conditions, you have to be the most committed of caucus goers. <laughs> and our poll has actually showed that when it comes to enthusiasm and commitment, it's Donald Trump who actually has the most. Well, I have to say, soon after I landed here last night, Mark, I hopped on the phone, started talking to voters who I've been in contact with throughout this process. And some of them still undecided, but they say nothing's going to prevent them from turning out to caucus on Monday. How do you think, I know it's still an X factor, I know you're not Al Roker, but how do you <laughs> think the weather could impact these results? Yeah, and again, you know, one of the reasons why we end up having seeing a caucus pro process is yeah. it does measure the intensity and enthusiasm. You know, there is no early vote. There is no vote by mail. There is no absentee. You either show up or you don't, regardless yeah. of the conditions. And so our own polling has been measuring intensity and enthusiasm for Trump and for everyone else. And we're going to see who really does have the most enthusiastic. And, and whether, whether you're Trump, DeSantis, or Nikki Haley. All right, we sure will. And I know you're going to be here to cover all of it. Mark Murray, thank you so Thanks, much. Kristen. Thanks for braving the elements <laughs> with me. We really appreciate it. And our special coverage here in Iowa is just getting started. On Sunday, I'll have a special edition of Meet the Press live right here from Des Moines. And on Monday, NBC News Now will have special coverage of the caucuses starting at 7 p.m. Eastern right here on NBC News Now. And now a very special moment here. I am going to toss it to my colleague, Yamish Alcindor, who is holding things down back in the Meet the Press studios in Washington, D.C. And Yamish, it is a special day for our entire NBC News family because you are back from maternity leave. I want to welcome you back. We have missed you, but we're thrilled you had that time with your family and with your precious new baby. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I am so grateful to have had the time off with my adorable baby boy. And Kristen, thank you for toughing it out in chilly Iowa for us. I missed you. <laughs> and seeing you out there in the elements, it just proves just how great of a, of a lead you are. So thank you so much. We will, of course, check back with you later this hour. And coming up, a major escalation in the Middle East. The U.S. military and its British allies launched strikes on more than 60 Houthi targets in Yemen. We have the details and the fallout next. You're watching Meet the Press Now. Welcome back. I'm Yami Shal Sender in Washington, where we continue to learn more about the U.S.-led strikes against Houthi targets in Yemen. It comes after a recent surge in attacks by the Iran-backed Houthis against shipping vessels in the Red Sea, and amid concerns that the ongoing conflict between Israel and Hamas could grow into a wider regional war. The U.S.-led strikes targeted multiple locations throughout Yemen. According to the U.S. Air Force, it struck over 60 targets at 16 locations using more than 100 precision-guided munitions. In a statement following the military action, President Biden said the strikes were intended to send a, quote, clear message that the U.S. and its partners would not tolerate attacks on its personnel or allow hostile actors to imperil the crucial waterway. In response, Houthi leaders have said they will not back down and have vowed to retaliate. Now, while speaking to reporters on Air Force One, the NSC's John Kirby was questioned about a potential war with Yemen. We're not interested in uh, a war with Yemen. We're not interested in a conflict of any kind here. In fact, everything the president has been doing has been trying to prevent uh, any escalation of conflict, uh, including the strikes last night. 
Joining me now is Courtney Cuby at the Pentagon. So, Courtney, tell us more about these strikes and what is this latest response by the U.S. and U.K.? Is it going to deter the Houthis and weaken some of their capabilities, possibly? So the strikes were targeting some of those capabilities. So things like launchers, uh, places where they were launching ballistic missiles and anti-ship cruise missiles, warehouses where they kept their munitions and some of these one-way attack drones, some of their command and control sites. So the idea here is to do just that, to try to deter future attacks. And I got to tell you, Amish, you know, they fired off the U.S. and the British military. They fired off more than 150 precision-guided bombs and missiles last night at more than 60 different targets. This was a huge bombing campaign that they undertook that uh, last night. So while we don't have a good sense yet still of the battle damage assessment, you have to assume they, they the military officials here believe that it was successful, uh, this targeting. You have to assume it was able to degrade at least some of the Houthis' capability to carry out these attacks against commercial shipping and, frankly, military ships in the Southern Red Sea. And that was the whole goal here, to try to deter those future attacks, but not just by taking out their capabilities, but also by sending a message to the Houthis and, frankly, Frankly, back to Iran, who backs uh, the Houthis with funding, uh, with equipment, with intelligence. Sending the message to the both of them, if you continue to carry out these attacks and you threaten global commerce, the U.S. and the, and the British military, at least, will respond. And as you talk about that message, I was also thinking about the idea that we had that map up and you said huge bombing strike. So can you talk a bit about how the countries in the region are reacting when you look at all of the different countries that are surrounding that area? So it's actually been kind of a mixed reaction, Yamish. So uh, NATO ally Turkey has condemned it, saying that it has the potential to escalate the situation further. Saudi Arabia, who has a difficult and bloody relationship, frankly, with a years of, of bombing campaign inside Yemen against the Houthis, uh, they have also condemned it. But keep in mind, they have reached this current ceasefire with the Houthis that's been holding now for more than a year, near, going on two years, actually. Uh, you, they do not want to get dragged back into any kind of a conflict in Yemen. They have condemned this. So has Oman, who generally has a pretty good relationship with the U.S., particularly military to military. But it's not just the U.S. Even though the U.S. and the British military were the ones who actually carried out these strikes last night, there were a number of other nations, including Australia, who, who were supportive of the strikes. They played sort of a non-operational role in supporting the strikes last night. And I have to say, remember, there is this continued marriage Maritime, op maritime operation there. It's called Operation Prosperity Guardian. This is a defensive maritime group that's come together. It's more than 20 nations now. Uh, they have been d patrolling through that region, trying to defend against continued Houthi attacks. This strike last night, these strikes, they were completely separate and apart from that. It's a totally different alliance now, Yamish. Well, such important reporting on what, of course, is a, a, a really important moment in this um, situation. So, Courtney QB at the Pentagon, thank you so much. Thanks. Let me now bring in Bilal Saab. He is a founding director, the founding director of the Defense and Security Program at the Middle East Institute and a former senior advisor at the Pentagon. So thank you so much for being here, Bilal. And I want to ask you, you have an article laying out the different options that the U.S. could have taken against the Houthis. And you called the strikes inside Yemen, quote, the least bad option. So what's your reaction to these strikes? Did they go far enough to stop the Houthis' attacks? Uh, it's good to be with you, and uh, it's good to be on your show again. Believe it or not, I actually wrote that article before the strikes happened, and I thought that that was the most likely course of action, and it so happened to be it. Look, the president was presented with a number of options, uh, which I believe, frankly, all of them were bad. Then it became an issue of which one do you choose that is the least bad and potentially most effective. And that is the course of action that the United States and the UK, along with um, a small number of other allies, have uh, pursued. Look, is it going to work? I mean, obviously, this is the million dollar question. The Houthis themselves have already said that we're going to retaliate, so it might still lead to escalation. But the bottom line is that our entire position in the Middle East. Our core interest in the Middle East, our enduring interest in the Middle East, is to protect freedom of commerce and navigation. So the alternative of inaction or adopting a defense-only posture was simply not going to work. Now it's a matter of pairing that uh, military uh, instrument with hopefully some kind of a, a more invigorated uh, diplomatic effort to try to come to a resolution of the Gaza uh, uh, war. 
and frankly call the bluff of the Houthis, because the reason why they seem to be launching these attacks is to support Hamas and to end Israel's war against Gaza. So let's just do a much better job on the Gaza front in hopes that this would sort of change the calculus of the Houthis. I'm not sure it's going to work, but we can test that proposition. Well, as you said, you're not sure it's going to work. So talk to us about how strategically significant the locations that were targeted are, and could they possibly weaken the Houthis' capabilities? Well, I agree with Courtney. I mean, those were not small strikes. Obviously, the lethality, the precision, the significance of them, they're all uh, certainly noteworthy. But the Houthis still have, obviously, uh, a tremendous amount of capabilities, all of it provided, as Courtney suggested, and she's correct, uh, by the Iranians. So this is a process, okay? This is not going to be a one-off strike that is going to um, debilitate the Houthis. This is a process. And if there's going to be a tit-for-tat, then you're going to have to up the ante a little bit more and escalate and try to go after more sensitive targets targets, and perhaps even leaders of the Houthis, which is going to require more accurate intelligence. And I hope that we're going to have the capabilities to collect that really precious intelligence. I want to ask you, you talk about intelligence. There's also this idea that this ultimately goes back to Iran. Even the British Foreign Minister, Foreign Secretary David Cameron, he was talking about this being a message not just for the Houthis, but also for Iran. So talk a bit about what impact that might have on Tehran and what could it deter it? Yeah, this is not a two-way conversation, for sure. This is a three-way conversation. This is uh, us, or if you want to say the Western coalition, the Houthis, and then the Iranians. Uh, the Iranians are obviously uh, involved, they're invested, given the fact that they, once again, provide material assistance to the Houthis, uh, whether it's the funding, whether it's the weapons, uh, the training, and lately, of course, the intelligence uh, to uh, strike those targets in the Red Sea, without which simply the Houthis are incapable of waging those uh, attacks. So is this going to deter the Iranians? We don't know. The honest answer is we don't know. We also do not know what is the precise nature of the relationship between the Houthis and the Iranians. How much control do the uh, Iranians exercise over the hosts? We don't know that. But once again, we have to test all of these propositions as we continue to apply diplomatic pressure paired with some use of force, which I believe is not only legal, but legitimate and necessary. And hopefully that combination with international cooperation will somehow deter the Iranians. And in the briefly, I want to ask you, what might retaliation by the Houthis look like? Well, in increased uh, uh, attacks against uh, commercial ships in the Red Sea. Uh, they might be using weapons that we did not think of before, uh, a combination of weapons. Uh, yeah. They can certainly um, make those uh, attacks more deadly, more intense, more frequent. Uh, and then once again, they have the capabilities. And this is going to take us quite some time. Uh, and I'm not going to put a specific you know, time frame on this, yeah. to actually severely degrade the capabilities of the Houthis. They've amassed a good amount over the years, uh, inherited some from the previous regime in uh, uh, Sana'a and Yemen, and obviously some provided by the Iranians. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Bilal Saab. I really appreciate you coming on and breaking this all down for us. Oh, it's a pleasure, absolutely. And up next, it's a countdown to election day at home and abroad as voters in Taiwan prepare to hit the polls hours from now amid rising tensions and threats from China. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back to Iowa, where caucus goers will be caucusing in just three days, but voters will be voting in the high stakes presidential election in Taiwan, with polls set to open in less than three hours. On the eve of that consequential election, the Senate unanimously approved a resolution highlighting Taiwan's commitment to democratic elections despite the looming threat by Beijing. Joining me now is Republican Senator from Alaska, Dan Sullivan, who, along with Senator Tim Kaine, introduced that bipartisan resolution on Taiwan. Senator, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Kristen, and Happy New Year from beautiful Alaska. Happy New Year to you. I do want to get to the elections in Taiwan, but first I want to ask you, of course, about the news that we have been talking about, President Biden ordering those airstrikes against Iran-backed Houthi targets in Yemen. What was your reaction to learning that? Do you think that it went far enough? No, I don't think it went far enough. I've been encouraging the Biden administration for weeks to take much more aggressive actions. So I supported the strikes, but they were long overdue. But, you know, the previous segment you just had on really gets to the heart of the matter, and that's the broader appeasement strategies that the Biden administration has undertaken with regard to Iran. 
They reversed a number of initiatives that the Trump administration had put forward. And I've actually talked to the president and Jake Sullivan directly about, hey, reestablishing deterrence with regard to Iran, and in particular, reimposing things like sanctions against their oil and gas sector, sanctions against their ballistic missile sector. So this is something I think is going to take a long time to reestablish deterrence. And we could also start with the Houthis. I've pressed Secretary Blinken. You know, they removed them from the list of uh, organizations that sponsor terrorism. I've pressed the Secretary of State for the last year and a half. Hey, put the Houthis back on that list. They're trying to kill Americans, for goodness sake. So there's a lot more we can do uh, that our government should be doing. But this was an important step. It was overdue, but I supported it. You're calling it appeasement. The Biden administration would undoubtedly take issue with that word. They would argue they are trying to get the Iran nuclear deal back on track. You are calling for tougher measures, though, and I wonder if you can be specific. What would those measures look like? For example, your colleague, Senator Lindsey Graham, is arguing that the U.S. should make strikes against the IRCG inside Iran. Is that something that you would support? Is that the type of tougher action that you're calling for? <clears throat> Yes, but let me just back up again, because I do think it's important, the context. During the Trump administration, yes, we pulled out of the JCPOA, uh, although we launched, the Trump administration launched a historic peace initiative. We reestablished deterrence by killing Soleimani, the head of the Quds Force, and we initiated very broad-based sanctions against their oil and gas sector. By the end of the Trump administration, the Iranians had about $4 billion dollars in foreign reserves. That's actually not a lot. Now they have about $70 billion in foreign reserves that enables them to fund their terrorist proxies, whether it's the Houthis, Hamas, Hezbollah. So I think reestablishing deterrence talks about, well, I would certainly support what Lindsey Graham's talking about on the kinetic side. But like I said, I had a pretty long discussion with Jake Sullivan and the president saying you would have bipartisan support to reestablish very strong sanctions against the Iranian oil and gas regime, which is a huge source of their power. And you may have seen, Kristen, just a few weeks ago, the UN sanctions against the Iranian ballistic missile sector uh, expired. We should be pressing that again. These aren't that difficult. You would have Republican and Democratic senators uh, supporting those kind of much more aggressive actions against Iran. And, of course, independent inspectors have determined that Iran is now closer to developing a nuclear weapon. But let me ask you, do you think that this is becoming a wider war, Senator? How concerned are you about that? Well, I'm concerned about it, and I think everybody is concerned about it. But I think the way in which you avoid a wider war is to show much more toughness with regard to Iranian proxies. I don't think Iran wants a, a broader war. And the key is, whether it's Hamas, uh, Hezbollah, or the Houthis, when they're taking action, particularly action, Kristen, and they've been doing this a lot just in the last few weeks, to kill American service members, that's where we need to draw the line. What happened with regard to um, uh, deterrence previously was that the Iranians thought uh, through the Quds Force that they could kill Americans with impunity. You might remember the Soleimani and the Quds Force ended up killing and wounding over 2,000 American service members in Iraq through Iraqi Shia militias. That had to stop and that's why I strongly supported and encouraged President Trump to kill the leader of the Quds Force, Soleimani. We certainly reestablished deterrence back then. And what I worry is that, that deterrence has now unraveled. It's difficult to reestablish deterrence. But if the president took much stronger by, uh, actions against the Iranians, kinetic and non-kinetic like sanctions, he would get support from both Democrat and Republican senators. I'm sure of that. Let me turn to Taiwan, Senator, and just ask you. Yep for your perspective about the elections there. Obviously, we are watching it closely here. For folks who are sitting at home wondering why Americans should care about this election, what is the answer and how concerned are you that the results of the election could further provoke China? 
Well, I think it's already provoking the Chinese Communist Party and Xi Jinping, and that is the concern. So the elections, as you mentioned, Kristen, are actually tomorrow. That will be the eighth presidential election uh, that, the China, that the Taiwanese have had. So very important. The uh, inauguration of whoever the new president is isn't until May. So we are likely going to see a very volatile and possibly even dangerous period in the Taiwan Strait. So what we need to be doing, and I think it's starting to happen, is our government needs to show strong support and resolve for Taiwanese democracy, and we need to um, enhance deterrence in the Taiwan Strait. You mentioned the resolution that we passed in the Senate yesterday. We had 50 co-sponsors on that resolution, Democrats and Re Republicans, liberals and conservatives, and then it passed unanimously in the Senate yesterday. That's good news. That's the United States Senate showing uh, not only the people of Taiwan, but the Chinese Communist Party and Xi Jinping. We support Taiwan democracy, and I think that's enormously important for our own national security interests, but to help the courageous people of Taiwan. Senator, let me ask you about the race for the White House. Obviously, I am here in Iowa where former President Trump, according to the polls, has a very strong lead. We'll have to wait and see what happens on Monday. An increasing number of your colleagues are now endorsing the former president, including Senator Barrasso. Do you plan to endorse Mr. Trump? Well, what I've said is I plan to endorse the Republican nominee, and I think President Trump is looking quite strong in that regard. And look, I think one of the most important things we can be doing right now is just um, comparing the policies of the Trump administration with the Biden administration. You know, Kristen, we've been talking about a very dangerous world. Think about what's happened under the Biden administration, an invasion of Ukraine, uh, a horrible, atrocious invasion of Israel, certainly uh, supported by the Iranian terrorist regime, huge tensions in the, China, uh, in the Taiwan Strait, as we just talked about. And I think a lot of that has been, you know, driven by the Biden administration's weakness. The president is cutting our military every year. This year's uh, Department of Defense budget Senator. shrinks the Army, shrinks the Navy, shrinks the Marine Corps. Uh, in terms of energy policies, we've unilaterally well, surrendered that. Senator, I, so I to Senator me, let well, me just so, let me just stop you there because Republicans are calling sure. for budget cuts that would presumably impact defense spending in the military as well. Would it not? Well, during the tr I'll, I'll tell you this: the second term of the Obama administration cut defense spending by almost 25 percent. It was actually one of the big reasons I ran for the U.S. Senate as a Marine Corps uh, officer myself. But, and during the Trump administration Senator, with the Republican I, I, Senate, we significantly, well, this is an important point, Chris, and we significantly increased defense spending and readiness. And I think that is such an important issue right now. By the way, a lot of Democrats support that. President Biden has put forward three years in a row, uh, his budget cuts defense spending while significantly increasing all the other federal agencies. This is a huge policy issue but, where there's disagreement. I think uh, President Trump and other Republicans have strong disagreement with President Biden on this. Senator, but at the same time, just in terms of what's happening right now, you have Republicans, particularly in the House, who are calling for budget cuts that would inevitably impact defense spending. But let, let me ask you about former President Trump. Of course, when you talk about his foreign policy, he has called for pulling back from NATO. But I want to ask you about some of the headlines this week. He was before a D.C. appeals court. His lawyers argued that a president would be immune from prosecution even if he ordered the assassination of a political rival by SEAL Team 6 unless he was impeached and convicted by the Senate. You, of course, voted to acquit former President Trump twice. Do you agree with this interpretation of presidential immunity? Is he above the law? Well, look, I have not seen uh, the details of the presidential immunity lawsuit, um, so I'm not going to comment on that. But what I do think is that well, all of these lawsuits... Well, I just read it to um, you, though. I just read it to you. Do and, you think he's above the law? Well, I mean, again, I, 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 I do... Uh, I don't think anyone's above the law, but I do a lot more uh, due diligence before I answer questions on a topic of that importance, not just listening from, uh, you know, reading it from, from a uh, news reporter. But let me make a broader point here, and I think it's an important one. 
all of these actions by different prosecutors, whether in Georgia or a couple in New York, um, you know, I think that what they're doing is they're only strengthening President Trump's support in the Republican Party. The people should be the ones choosing the next president, not, you know, liberal prosecutors in New York. Uh, and I think that that's becoming a, a broader issue in these um, elections that are coming up. They're certainly becoming a broader issue with regard to what's happening in the Republican primaries. And of course, the indictments, the federal indictments that he is facing were brought by an independent special counsel. Senator, I thank you for your time today. I have to say, we did a fact check. It is colder here in Iowa than it is in Alaska today. <laughs> so we thank you very much for joining well, us on I this very chilly be, Friday I hear you guys for the might caucuses. Be getting, <laughs> I, I hear you might be getting a big storm there. So, so hang in there, but it's always great to have beautiful snowy weather. Certainly we love it in Alaska. Uh, we will. We're enjoying it here. Thank you so much, Senator. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Chris. And when we come back from the break, we do have much more. Meet the press now. Do stay with us. Yamish will pick up for Washington with new developments and turmoil on Capitol Hill. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. While much of the political world is focused on Iowa right now, we're also keeping a close eye on Capitol Hill. We are just one week away from a potential partial government shutdown and three weeks away from a potential complete government shutdown. Today, House Speaker Mike Johnson said he is sticking with a deal on top line spending numbers for 2024 that he reached with Democrats last week. But some in his party are opposed to the deal. Chairman of the Freedom Caucus, Bob Good announced today that he opposes the agreement. That makes it more likely that Speaker Johnson will have to rely on Democrats to keep the government open. Senior national political reporter Sahil Kapoor joins me now from Capitol Hill. So, Sahil, break this all down. How much pressure is Speaker Johnson facing right now from the far right of his own party? Hey, Yamish. Well, it's substantial pressure because it comes from the same group of right-wing troublemakers who ousted uh, Speaker Johnson's predecessor, Kevin McCarthy. They've shown that they're willing to use scorched-earth tactics to get what they want in this tiniest of tiny majorities, and they're demanding that he walk away from the spending deal. But Johnson also faces pressure from other quarters, from centrist Republicans who are telling him, stick to this deal, that he has to keep his word here, as well as Senate Democrats and Senate Republicans who say it's important that he stick by his agreement on this topic line spending deal. Yes, it's a little less spending than Kevin McCarthy got in his uh, deal with President Biden, so there are wins for uh, conservatives to count here, but it's not enough for these right-wing members. And the question is, are they willing to take the L and go home and be content with these modest wins in divided government, or are they going to try something drastic like they did with Kevin McCarthy and threaten his job? Well, of course, as you just mentioned, former Speaker Kevin McCarthy, this situation reminds me of exactly how he got ousted. So is there any talk, any pressure there of possibly ousting Speaker Johnson? Well, it's certainly a lot of deja vu here, Yamish, but there's no specific plot to oust Speaker Johnson. Let's put it that way. There are some Republicans, like most notably Texas Congressman Chip Roy, who have said this is a tool that is on the table if that spending deal isn't adjusted. He hasn't gone beyond that and explicitly threatened to do it. But there are other members, including in the Freedom Caucus, like Ralph Norman, who say it's not going to happen, that uh, Mike Johnson is not going to get ousted so soon. Uh, Congressman Bob Good, who is one of those eight votes to overthrow Kevin McCarthy and is currently the chairman of the Freedom Caucus, said it was a ridiculous supposition to even talk about overthrowing Mike Johnson just a few months into the job. So at the, at the moment, his job doesn't appear to be in danger, but this is, you know, let's, let's think of it as a lot of straw suddenly on the camel's back. The honeymoon is over. He's going to have to figure out a way out of this jam and keep the government funded when you've got just four days, Yamish, uh, on Monday when Congress returns uh, to get that job done. Uh, quite the countdown, and I will underscore, at the moment, his job is not um, on the line. So thank you so much, Sahil, for your reporting. Thank you. And joining me now is the panel on set is Mariana Sotomayor. She's a congressional reporter for The Washington Post. Simone Sanders Townsend, former senior advisor to Vice President Kamala Harris and co-host of The Weekend, which is premiering tomorrow on MSNBC. And Republican strategist Brad Todd. So, Mariana, I want to come to you because we are using words like plot, like partial government shutdown versus complete government shutdown. It's all head spinning. Can you just break down what's going on on the Hill right now? Yeah, today I felt... <laughs> 
completely head spun around and literally had to say that to a couple of sources because that's what happens on Capitol Hill sometimes, especially when things are moving. And yeah, we actually saw Johnson stick to his plan and stick to what a majority of Republicans in his conference want him to do. There are concerns about, you know, cutting spending, addressing the border. Those things are still happening. Those conversations still happening. But, you know, a lot of Republicans saying, we are still going to defend you. You need to stick with this deal because it's already been baked in. They've wasted so many months last year to only get to a similar deal. So is the government going to shut down? It's a question mark. I've been hearing from some sources that it's possible that they actually do a short-term extension, which is something that Johnson has said he would not do to try and appease the far right. So any move that Johnson makes right now, he's going to get backlash from the far right. He's going to get backlash from the moderates. But that, the fact that there is still some goodwill the fact that there are Republicans, including from those hardline members, yeah. who are saying, we can't oust him, we couldn't agree on anyone for three weeks, who are we going to agree on next if we try and oust someone? So as of right now, it's a little sticky. Sticky is a good yeah. word. Sticky is a good <laughs> word. Uh, Simone, I want to also now turn, of course there's Iowa that's just looking us down the road here, but there's also New Hampshire, which is where Senator Joe Manchin, our favorite senator who just goes around <laughs> touring right now, um, not declaring that he's running for president, but touring and listening to people. I want to play a little bit of sound from him in New Hampshire. Here he is. And then you have to make a decision. The character of that candidate, whether you agree or disagree, whether you uh, support or haven't supported whether you're in the same political party or not. Mm -hmm. The people that are just telling me I'm going to vote for the Democrat because I'm a Democrat, I'm going to vote for the Republican no matter who it is, that's bullcrap. <laughs> vote for the person. Vote for the best person that should be leading this country. So that was Joe Manchin non-committally answering a question from a voter about who they should vote for. Again, he is someone who is a, <laughs> is a Democrat, but he is not saying vote for Joe Biden. So tell me, how worried should Democrats be when you have someone like Senator Joe Manchin, who's always been a thorn in their side, answering a question like that? Well, I was waiting for Senator Manchin to tell us who he thinks is the best person. Uh, and I, I think it's telling that he did not answer that question, maybe partially because he hopes to be a, a pick for uh, no labels. I, I don't think no labels is seriously considering uh, Senator Manchin, but I think Senator Manchin himself would like to be considered. Look, I think the thing that should keep Democrats up at night is not Joe Manchin and his town hall in New Hampshire, but rather the real threat of third party candidates and and what the Joe Manchin conversation represents, because that is very real. I think in this election, more so than any other um, in re recent presidential election history, third parties really have the ability to do real damage. And all the data and history suggests that that damage will be to the Democratic candidate, Joe Biden, and not to the whoever the Republican nominee ends up to be, who we assume to be uh, Donald Trump. You know, do you agree? And, and uh, talk a little bit about what you're thinking. Well, Joe Manchin's a pretty good weather vane. He's, he's been tuned over many decades. And so I think if I were a Democrat, I would say that what I would be most worried about is the fact that Joe Manchin, who is highly tuned to be a centrist weather vane, feels like it's not the popular thing to say that. And this is evidence in Joe Biden's problems with independence. He's got to win back independence if he's going to win re-election. And he would need people who Joe Manchin is looking for for approval uh, if that's if he's going to win. And now talking more about sort of presidential politics, who would you rather be, Nikki Haley or Ron DeSantis? Brad? Well, Nikki Haley is closer to Donald Trump in, in an early state, so I'd rather be Nikki Haley. And she has momentum. And what do we know about early primaries is that momentum really matters a lot. Uh, I do think she wants to finish second in Iowa. I think if she's within one or two points, she'll try to say she beat expectations. But she is the candidate with momentum in this race. Uh, and in addition, President Trump, he's President Trump's going to former President Trump's going to get 50 percent, maybe, uh, of this Iowa electorate. He got half that in 2016. So I think all the attention's focused on who's second. But he, there probably should be some credit given to the fact that he's going to double his vote from 16 there. Can I make a point about Nikki Haley? I think I, I too, would, uh, if I was a betting lady, put my bets on Nikki Haley. The concern, I, I think, that Republicans who are you know, putting putting their, their their chips in Nikki Haley's basket is what happens after New Hampshire. Let's just say she does well in Iowa. She wins or comes up very close second in New Hampshire. Uh, Nevada, she's participating in the state-run primary, not the, not the party-run.
Run Caucus. And in South Carolina, she is not favored to win. There has not been a nominee for president, let alone a president who has gotten the nomination and then won the presidency and lost their home state. Mm, that's a good, that's, that's a really good point. I also want to, of course, turn to the really big issue in Iowa, which is the weather. Mariana, you've been there, you've covered the caucuses. How much of an impact do you think this could have? These are people who are used to cold, but this is a different kind of cold and a different kind of snow. Yeah, I mean, we have seen all week a number of these candidates canceling events mm -hmm. simply because you can't get to them. And, and I, that is something that I have experienced and driving through that as a Floridian, do not recommend. <laughs> but most people, to your point, sure, they might know to drive and, and, and get there, but it, it, it is a problem. It is a, it, it is a legitimate turnout problem. And we've seen candidates like Nikki Haley telling a lot of people, listen, I know the weather is going to be bad, but yeah. please carefully, safely try and get there because the problems that we want to fix is much bigger than a snowstorm. So please turn out. And Brad, I want to ask you about, of course, Donald Trump, who is leading the Republican um, nomination there. He, his lawyers this week were in court saying that he could assassinate a political rival using tail SEAL Team 6, um, and if he wasn't impeached and convicted by the Senate, he would not be able to be criminally held liable by that, by that. That, of course, to me, in my mind, connects to the fact that Trump has said he could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and get away, from, away with it. What do you make of where we are now and the fact that Trump is still able to hold on to voters, those evangelical voters, those rural voters? He's holding on. Uh, well, I'm not a lawyer, uh, but I would tell you that that's bad politics. Uh, and, and typically in these cases, the lawyers don't really listen to the political advisors. Uh, and so we'll see if it has an, has an impact going, going forward. Uh, there are a lot of Republican voters who want to be on his side in a lot of these cases. So the manner in which he conducts himself in the case probably will determine whether they take his side. It's bad politics for everyone but Donald Trump, who voters are saying, well, yeah, I kind of like the fact that he's strong. Well, a lot of rules have not applied to him in politics, for sure, for quite a long time. Part of it's because voters see him as a disruptor. And they think that he doesn't mean everything he says. And they, that, but, it, but he will, is willing to say things that weren't scripted for him. And so that, that level of candor that he gives off also gets him a lot of latitude with a lot of voters. Last 30 seconds, Simone. I mean, what do you make of this? I think that people should take Donald Trump at his word. What we know now that went on during the Trump administration, and we just know a sliver of the details of what happened. I think that the former president does mean what he says. I, I think it's so outlandish, though. It is hard for people to believe, but I encourage people to watch his actions. Yeah, watch his actions and see sort of how this all goes. I am so thankful for all of you for being here, for, for talking us through this. Um, Mariana, Simone, Brad, thank you, of course, at home for watching, and thank you for welcoming me back as I came back from maternity leave. Uh, Kristen Welker will be back on Monday with a special Iowa Caucus Day edition of Meet the Press Now. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press Live from Iowa on your local NBC news station. And we're also back Monday night for a special live coverage of the Iowa caucus. The news continues with Hallie Jackson straight ahead. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.